Okay, so we've been doing a brief overview of each book of the Bible. We finished the Old Testament. We finished the intertestamental period last Tuesday. And so now we're starting Matthew through John. <coughs> Matthew through John is probably read more by churchianity than any other portion of Scripture. And because they don't rightly divide, it's also very misunderstood. So because of that, I want to spend a little more detail on this, probably take a I, I would think we wouldn't get through it all tonight. Um, let's start in Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Because a lot of what churches usually teach is that the Old Testament was written to Israel and then the New Testament is written to us today. They say that, well, yeah, Jesus came to Israel, but they crucified him. And so now we are spiritual Israel today. And so everything in Matthew through Revelation applies to us. That's generally what fundamental churchianity teaches. But, and you can look, if you start reading Matthew, which we'll do today, you could see that it's different. God's handling things differently in Matthew than he was in the Old Testament. And so that's why I wanted to look at Isaiah 28. Uh, in Isaiah 28, uh, verses 9 through 13. So we're going to look at Isaiah 28. Verses 9 through 13. Just because we have a Bible that has a page before Matthew that says the New Testament doesn't mean that all of a sudden this is to us and the Old Testament was to Israel. Uh, in fact, it's prophesied in Israel over there in Jeremiah 31 that God would make a new covenant. The word testament is the same as covenant. God would make a new covenant with the nation of Israel. Jeremiah 31, 31, I think it is. So if the old covenant was to Israel and God promises in Jeremiah 31 that he'll make a new covenant with them, then the New Testament would also be a reference to Israel. And what's going on here is that Israel is like children, basically, due to their unbelief. And so God has to deal with them as children and the prophecy in Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 13, applies to that time when the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which starts with John the Baptist and Matthew chapter 3. So Isaiah 28 and verse 9, the question is asked, uh, Isaiah 28, verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So you can see the spiritual condition of Israel is they are weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast. In other words, they're like toddlers or babies, uh, spiritually speaking. They're not full-grown adults. You know, for us today, when you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for your sin, you are no more a child, but you are considered a son, an heir of God. Uh, Galatians 4 tells you that. Spiritually speaking, when we believe the gospel, we are considered to be adults. But Israel, due to the nation being apostate and in unbelief, uh, the question is, well, who is he going to teach knowledge? Whom is he going to make to understand doctrine? Well, it's the ones who were just actually weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast. In other words, they're the ones who are separate. You, know, you think of Israel as the mother here. And so if you're weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, that means now you're just getting out of the mother's nourishment and now you're, you know, maybe you're six months old, a year old, two years old, whatever it is. Um, and so now you're still a child, but uh, now at least you can, if you're weaned from uh, the milk and drawn from the breast, the idea there is these are the people who are going out to John the Baptist or going to Jesus and they repent, they believe the gospel of the kingdom, they confess their sins, they're water baptized. And so now, what Jesus does is the teaching ministry of Jesus is to those people, those who are just those new, newly uh, believers, and they don't really know much doctrine because they were under the religious system of Israel, which was teaching, the, had rejected the commandment of God that they may keep their own tradition. And so for these people, it says in verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. You know, when I went to kindergarten, um, I couldn't understand uh, accounting or, you know, some of these subjects that I took in college. 
global economics, uh, intermediate macroeconomics. I, you know, you can't understand that those things when you're in kindergarten. You're learning your ABCs. You're learning to count to a hundred, and you know, just the different. You learn how to tie your own shoes. I mean, it's very basic stuff that you're doing. And that's what God is saying here. He's saying, when the kingdom of heaven is at hand, at that at hand phase, I'm going to wean them from the milk, draw them from the breast, those who go out to John the Baptist, confessing their sins, repenting, being water baptized. And so then I'm going to teach them the doctrine that they need, but it's going to be, you're just like a kindergartner, you don't give them advanced economics. Uh, the kindergartner has to get the very basics because they're little kids. And that's what God is saying here. He's precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? Stammering lips. And hopefully we'll get that to that tonight. But stammering lips is a reference to Jesus speaking in parables. And then it says, and another tongue. Another tongue would be what happens in Acts chapter 2, the uh, speaking in unknown tongues. Unknown to the speaker, but known to the listener. So this is actually a prophecy here of what's going to happen in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in early Acts. Um, and then verse 12, To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. That's why that they end up would not hear. In other words, they crucified him. All of Israel is given the opportunity to go out to John, to confess their sins, be baptized by John, and then be taught precept upon precept, line upon line, with these parables, stammering lips, and with another tongue, speaking in unknown tongues. Uh, but it says uh, they that's the refreshing for them. They're finally going to get out of that apostate religious system. These, those pastors that destroyed and scattered the sheep of my pasture, as Jeremiah 23 says, but yet they would not hear. They didn't accept Christ by faith. They, by wicked hands, crucified and slain him. So, uh, but the people who would listen, this is what's going to happen. Verse 13, the word of the Lord was unto them, those who would hear, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And all that last part there is a reference to the tribulation period where they go through their finer's fire. They are broken and snared and taken by the Antichrist and taken over by that. But of course, spiritually speaking, they grow and they end up getting into the kingdom. So this is a prophecy of what happens in the book of Matthew. So when we get to Matthew, uh, the point is that because they're children... God has not given up on the nation of Israel yet. Um, he is still continuing that program. And the program, now if we look in Daniel chapter 9, in Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 24, there's a prophecy that God gives to Daniel. And he says in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Seventy weeks, that's weeks of years. So 490 years. So unlike today, yes, when is Jesus going to come and rapture up the body of Christ? I think it'll be soon, but it could be 5,000 years from now. I really don't know. There are no time markers in the Bible that tells me. It seems like the events are lining up and that the rapture would take place, but I can't say that definitively because there are no time markers. But for Israel, they had time markers. He says there's 70 weeks, that's 490 years. And in verse 25, it tells you, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So it tells you that once the commandment goes forth to restore and to build Jerusalem, which takes place in Nehemiah chapter 2, Cyrus sent in Nehemiah to go rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, when that commandment is given, the 490-year clock starts. And so you can go forward from there, if you, or in the case if you're living in Jesus' day, John the Baptist's day, you can look at that timeline, that time clock, and you can see that we're getting close to the end of the 490 years. 
And it tells you in verse 26 that uh, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. So that's a reference to his cut off from land of the living. Isaiah 53 verse 8 says it's a reference to his death. So you can, unlike today, you ask me when the rapture is going to take place, I can't turn to a verse to tell you the clock, the time clock started at this point and now we've got 20 years left or whatever it is. There's no time markers. But Israel had time markers. They know when the commandment went to restore and build, rebuild Jerusalem. And they could count forward and they could see then when you get to the time of um, John the Baptist that the time is at hand. It's very close to the time where Messiah is going to be crucified and then the seven-year covenant with the Antichrist, that seven-year tribulation period, and then Jesus' second coming. So they know, so what, when we get then to Matthew chapter 3, and John appears on the scene, he says in Matthew 3 and verse 2, Matthew 3 verse 2, when John starts preaching, and Matthew 3 verse 1 it says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in chapter 4 and verse 17, six months later, Jesus starts his earthly ministry, and he says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, I can't do that today. I can't say, Repent, for the rapture is at hand. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. But because Israel had time markers, 490 years till it's, it's finished for them, and they knew that started with the commandment to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Then they could count and say, wow, we're pretty close. Uh, so that's why it's called, so what happens here in Matthew, and remember from last time, there's about a 400 year gap between the Old and the New Testament, between Malachi and Matthew. That 400 years factors into the 490 year timeline there. And so we are now 30 years or so after, uh, you know, we're about 30 AD or so at this time because Jesus and John the Baptist are now 30 years old. So Jesus was born, if the dates are right, he was born in 0 AD. And so if he's 30 years old, then he would be, it would be 30 AD. So you know that based on that 490 year time, span that it's got to be real close. So Matthew 3, 2 and Matthew 4, 17 says, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. And so we refer to this time here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at, as the and early Acts as the at hand phase of the kingdom. Now, of course, what ends up happening is in Acts 9, God puts that program on hold and God starts the dispensation of grace that we're in today with the Apostle Paul. Because if, if he didn't put that on hold, then the kingdom would have been, Jesus' second coming, the tribulation period in the kingdom would have started almost 2,000 years ago. Um, and that didn't happen. You just look at what's going on in the world and you can tell Jesus Christ is not ruling on the throne in Jerusalem. Uh, Satan is still the god of this world, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. But, of course, at that time, beginning of Matthew, they didn't know that. It was still a mystery. So when, by going by the time clock from Daniel, they know the kingdom is at hand. And it's about time for the Messiah to be cut off from the land of the living in order to uh, be that sacrifice for their sins so that they can uh, have their sins forgiven and enter into the kingdom right after the Antichrist. So you notice here just by reading it, just because it said New Testament before we started Matthew, it doesn't mean this is written to us today. It means that the kingdom is at hand for Israel. It's just continuing that Daniel time clock from Daniel 9. It's continuing it right on here. And uh, there are four Gospels. Um, they're called the Gospels. The name, I think, comes from, because in Mark chapter 1, Mark is the only one that has this, but in Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
So Mark's gospel is called the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's probably why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the gospels. Gospel just means good news. So what I wanted to do then is talk about, uh, first, to talk about the different emphasis of these different books. Um, Matthew, let's say you're, you're new to a church, you're a new Christian, and a lot of times they'll tell you, maybe they hand you a, a Gideon's New Testament, so then you start reading that, you read Matthew, and you think, wow, this is great, you know, I'm learning about Jesus, he died for my sins, all these miracles he did, the parables he taught, uh, casting out the devils, you know, this is all really great. And then you say, I can't wait to read the next book. So you get to Mark, and you start reading Mark, and you say, well, I thought I just read that stuff over there in Matthew. This looks to be the same information. Presented a little differently, but the same. Huh. I wonder why that is. Well, let me go to Luke and check that out. So then you start reading Luke, and you say, well, this is just like Matthew and Mark. Uh, you know, I'm getting the same information in all these books. And uh, we've said before that God's word is true. God cannot lie. When God tells you something, it is true. You better pay attention. But the more important something is, it seems like the more God will repeat himself. The call of Paul in the book of Acts to start the dispensation of grace. That's given in Acts 9 and Acts 22 and Acts 26. The same, a little different information, but the same recounting of it. You know, he only had to tell us once, but if God tells us three times, you think, wow, this must be a significant event that he tells us three times. Well, with Jesus, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all four of them, now John's a little different, and we'll get into why that is, but all four of them have some of the exact same information. The details may be a little different, but the stories are the same. All four give you the crucifixion. All four give you the resurrection. Yeah, all four give you... You know, a couple other uh, the parables, uh, or the uh, miracles, but especially uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a lot of similarities among the three of those. So if God tells you something once, it's important. If he tells you something twice, you really better pay attention. Well, he's telling you something four times here with Jesus. Um, so yeah, he's repeating himself, but he's repeating himself because what Jesus did is the most important event uh, or Jesus life on this earth is by far more important than anybody else's life that ever lived I mean there is no comparison the end of the book of John even tells you um, I think it's in chapter 21 the end there John 21 uh, he says the last two verses John 21 verses 24 and 25 John 21, verse 24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And people will say, oh, that's hyperbole, he's exaggerating. I don't think he is, because first off, how would I know he's exaggerating? He doesn't seem to be. I mean, that's how he ends it. And, uh, and so Jesus accomplished what he lived maybe 33 years, um, some, somewhere around there. He accomplished so much that you couldn't even contain, you know, in other words, you couldn't explain it all in the books. You look at, you look at Scripture. I mean, God is a reward of those who diligently seek him. And uh, a lot of this stuff, you know, is hard to understand. You diligently seek the Lord, you get information, but we still don't understand it all. Um, and so if every single thing was written down, the whole world couldn't contain the books. And mainly what it's talking about isn't just the physical things like we would think of, you know. Well, he got up and he brushed his teeth and then he ate breakfast and then he took a shower. You know, not that stuff. But it's really when it says the, the world couldn't contain everything he did, it's really a reference to everything he did in the spiritual world. Uh, and we don't really, we can't see the spiritual realm. But I think it's just going to be amazing when we get to heaven to uh, learn all these things. Now that we're in the spirit realm, and you can find out all the things he did, that he did. You know, spoiling principalities and powers, triumphing over them in the cross. 
and the details of how he did that. You know, how, how are you going to write all of that down and explain it? Um, so it's just, uh, you know, it's just, you know, how can you put to words how wonderful Jesus' first coming was and everything he did? I mean, he lived the perfect life. Uh, he overcame sin. A hundred billion people have lived on this world and not a single one have ever done what Jesus did and they never will. And then, you know, living that perfect life. Then he does these miracles and cast out devils and he's trying to bring up the disciples. He's looking out for all these other people that for them, so Israel may be saved. And then, oh, by the way, he takes on your sin and he pays for it fully. Everybody sins who ever believes the gospel, past, present, and future, regardless of what dispensation, all of those sins are put on, upon him. He makes the full payment for those. And oh, by the way, he didn't just barely get you to squeak into heaven, but he gave you his abundant life, giving you a glorified body, a resurrection life, in heaven for all eternity. Um, it's just, you know, it's just mind-blowing what he did. Uh, and so it's no wonder that you got four books. It seems like you should have... 400 books talking about this stuff, repeating it over and over so that maybe you'll get it through your thick skull. You know, I have to read things over and over for me to understand it, to remember it. So uh, that's why we have the four Gospels. But specifically, each Gospel has their own emphasis. And uh, because there are four prophecies of Jesus that are in the Old Testament and of, of what the Messiah would be, I should say. And on your outline, I gave you all the scriptures, so uh, we won't go over them. But there are, um, there are the branch statements from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I know um, Ernie in the uh, home Bible studies he's done with Lenny and Lisa, uh, he's gone over these things. So, I mean, if you want, you can go back and see what he's given on, on my channel if you want the details of that going over those verses. Uh, but So I'll just briefly mention that if you look at the branch statements in the Old Testament, or if you look at the behold statements, you'll find uh, there are four, four uh, aspects or four differences here of, or four roles, that's the best word I can say, four roles that the Messiah would fulfill as prophesied in the Old Testament. And so each gospel gives you the different role. So, uh, if you got your outline, you can on your own time look up the branch statements. I gave you the references. Or look up the behold statements. I gave you the references for those as well. And there's also what Ernie went through in Ezekiel chapter 1. There are the four faces of the cherubs and that matches up as well. Uh, but we'll just put them on the board here and then, uh, and then I'll show you examples from the four Gospels so you can see the differences. Because although if you're a new Christian, you read Matthew and then you read Mark, and then you read Luke, and it all pretty much says the same thing. You think it's just repeating itself. There are subtle differences based upon the emphasis of the role that Jesus would play for that gospel writer. So Matthew shows Jesus as Israel's king. Shows him as king. Mark shows Jesus as Israel's servant. And of course, ultimately, this refers to he would also be our king in the body of Christ in heavenly places and our, you know, the servant for us and the perfect man and God as well. But it's just that's not revealed till you get to Paul. The mystery was hid in God until you get to Paul. So you won't find the mystery and the heavenly aspects of Jesus in the four Gospels. you got to get to Paul to find that out. So it's showing, Matthew is showing Jesus as king. Mark shows Jesus as servant. Luke shows Jesus as man. And then John shows Jesus as God. And that's why when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are together. People will refer to these, the theological term they use, because they got to give you a, a fancy word since you paid a lot to go to seminary school. They will call these three the synoptic gospels. And all that means, synoptic, it just means they're similar. There's a lot of similar information there. And John is quite different. Uh, again, still shows the crucifixion and resurrection and some of those basic things, but uh, shows it's a lot different from the other three. 
So the, the seminary schools out there, what they'll say is, they'll say, well, Mark wrote down his gospel, and, uh, and then Matthew and Luke saw that, and they decided to copy off of it. But there were some copy errors or some uh, writers' uh, editing privileges that they did, and so then they just changed it around. That's the theological, non-supernatural, atheistic, unbeliever view that the seminaries put on all their people. The truth is that the Holy Ghost, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the Holy Ghost gave the inspiration to these writers to write showing these different roles. And the reason these three are called synoptic gospels or similar, as you can see the roles. I mean, just look at a servant versus a man. He's a perfect servant and a perfect man. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time uh, being a servant. I'm a man, and I'm also a servant. I go to work 40 hours a week serving, and then I serve here with the Bible studies and uh, try to help my mom out. You know, and you do that thing. You serve a lot in your life, and you're also a man or a woman, whatever it is. But so that you can see, obviously, that these, if you're concentrating on, you know, you as a servant versus you as a man, there's going to be a lot of similar information because as a man, I go to work every day, five days a week, and as a servant, I go to work every day, five days a week. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of similar information. Jesus as king, now that may be a little bit different, but that's still a man. He, he's a man there. In fact, when we look at Matthew, what's interesting, uh, a lot of times, and this is what we want to uh, focus on today, is when we look at Jesus, He's fully God and fully man. But in churchianity, they focus on the God part and they don't focus on the man part. They think all these miracles he did was as God, but no. no actually, you read the book of Matthew, Jesus never, in the book of Matthew, he never refers to himself as God. He does in John. He doesn't do it in Matthew. Now, other people will say like, Peter, Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter recognizes him as a son of God. And Jesus is God, no doubt about that. But in Matthew, you never see Jesus referring to himself as God, but you see it in John. So you could see Matthew, if he's a man, as a king. And Mark, he's a man, a servant. And Luke, he's the perfect man. Well, you can understand that if they're writing about Jesus and these different aspects, you're going to have a lot of similar stories. Maybe the, the emphasis and the details are a little different, but you're going to have very similar stories. But John showing Jesus as God, now that's on a whole other realm there. You know, I am a man, I am a servant, and you might could say I'm king of this house because I'm the only one here. Uh, you know, but I'm not, I don't really consider myself a king. But God? No, no, don't, don't ever think that I'm God. I'm not even close, you know. Uh, that's a whole other level, a whole other realm than man. So that's why John, is his gospel is so different from the others. And so uh, rather than going through, um, you know, the branch statements and the, the behold statements and the, the four faces of the cherubs, because um, Ernie's already done a great job with that, Instead, I thought what we'd do is just go over a couple examples here and uh, show you how they differ in telling the same information. So we're going to look at, the, the two that we're going to look at is, uh, I think I've had to put this in here. Let me just, let me create more room. I'm going to rewrite this and put more room up here so I can put them side by side here. Matthew... Jesus is king. Mark, he is servant. Luke, he is man. And John, he is God. Okay, so now let's look at... And I need a heading here. Let's look at the genealogy. Genealogy. May not have spelled that right. Genealogy in Matthew. So remember, he's going to show him as king. So Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, 
the son of Abraham. The first name mentioned in the genealogy is Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. I'll, just, I'll just put 1.1. 1, 1. That way I have more room. Son of David. David, if we, you've been going to the, our Monday night study, you know that um, God has made David his eternal king and he's made the son of David, Jesus Christ, his eternal king as well. So you've got um, in the genealogy there as king, right away you see son of David. But he's also got to be Abraham, going back to Abraham, because the promise of the land, you know, if you're a king, like I said, I'm king of this house, well, that's not a big deal. I'm not ruling anybody because I'm the only one here, you know. Uh, so it's not a big deal. But Jesus is king of Israel. And to be king of Israel, he's got to have the land. The promise of the land goes back to Abraham. So he's also, he's son of David, but he's also son of Abraham. And you get the genealogy starting in verse 2. It starts at Abraham because that's where the promise of the land is. So this is land, and this is king. So that's why he's looking at Abraham and David, and he goes back in verse 2, Abraham beget Isaac. He starts with Abraham, because that's where Israel starts, the promise of the land. you got to have a land to be the king of the land. I'm the king of this house because I own this house. Nobody else is in here, but I'm king, you know, by myself. You know, that. I don't have any disagreements that way either. <laughs> so you got land and king, so we start with the land, Abraham beget Isaac. And it goes through there. Verse 6 talks about David. And it specifically says, Jesse beget David the king. And David the king beget Solomon. Only one person is mentioned as king, David. Because he is the one given that promise. And of course his son. So we got to show that he's the son of Abraham. So he has the right to the land. We got to show he's the son of David. To show he the, has the right to be king over that piece of land. And so uh, you go down to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. From David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14. From the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So you notice the emphasis in the genealogy is on David and it's on Abraham. Okay, now um, let's look at uh, the genealogy in the book of Mark. So we look at genealogy... And Matthew, it corresponds to the king, because God had the king and the land. So here is the servant. Uh, Mark 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That, there is no genealogy. There is no listing of names here. Because as a servant, uh, there's none because you don't care about that. You think of a servant, like I mentioned, I'm a servant at work. When I apply for the job that I got, I did not send them a list to say, okay, my mother's name is Marlene, my father's name is Dwight, my mother's uh, parents' names are Gertrude and John, my, my dad's parents' names are uh, Mabel and Alfred. Uh, I didn't go through all these names of these people because the people at work, frankly, don't care what the names of these people are or what their background is. The question with the servant is, can you get the job done? So when I put on my resume, I put, I graduated from this college with this GPA, I got a master's degree, I uh, worked for this company uh, out of college, and then I went to this other company, and then I, when I came to Alabama, I worked for Jefferson County, and so I had all these different things that I've worked for, different job positions, my duties in all of them. So again, they don't care where I came from, they look at that resume and say, oh, well, Eric seems has to have the qualifications and experience to get the job done, so let's hire him. Uh, so there is no genealogy needed for a servant. You don't put on your on there your you know unless you're like maybe if you're Donald Trump's son maybe you put that on there. I don't know, but you know just an ordinary person you you don't put the names of who you're related to on there. You put your information to see if you get the job done. And so Mark it moves fast. It's all about work. It's all about work. That's why it's a shorter one. It's the shortest of the Gospels. You look here, uh, look at Mark 1 while you're here. Um, you know, when you're working, you're doing things. You say, you say to me, well, what did you do today? Well, I went to work and I looked at my email and then I printed out travel reports and then I checked out the travel reports and then I entered in the system 
And then I made corrections or I contacted the different departments. And I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. It's just work, 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 work. So that's what you see in Mark. Verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea. Verse 6. And John was clothed. Verse 7. And preached saying. Verse 9. And it came to pass. Verse 10. And straightway coming up. Verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven. Verse 12. And immediately the Spirit. Verse 13. And he was there in the wilderness. Verse 15. And saying the time is fulfilled. Verse 17. And Jesus said unto them. You see, all those verses starting with and, because we're seeing what the servant does. We're seeing him work. You know, with, with me, I say, what did I do as a servant today? I go through the list. I did this and, and that and that and that and that and that. And I just go through this list. That's what Mark is doing. There's no genealogy. And with the servant, we want to see him get the job done. So we just keep seeing and, 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 and. Okay, Luke. Let's look at the genealogy for Luke. Now, Luke's genealogy is in chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Luke has the most complete list of names, the most complete genealogy. Um, well, I shouldn't say most complete. They're all complete in the aspect that they're showing. There aren't any incomplete genealogies. It's just to show Jesus as the perfect man, they got to show him related to the first man, Adam. So you got to go all the way back from Jesus all the way back to Adam. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, it goes all the way back to God. So you see in verse 23, Luke 3, 23, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. By the way, that's how we know uh, he started his ministry at age 30. Uh, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Notice Joseph was not his father. God was his father. It was supposed that Joseph was his father, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mephit, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Janna, which was the son of Joseph, and on and on and on and on it goes until you get all the way back to the beginning, verse 38, verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Adam is man. The word Adam in Hebrew, it, the English translation of the word Adam is man. So the son of Adam, so Adam is man, but he's also the son of God. And Jesus, then, is also man, but he is also the Son of God. So you've got here the genealogy for Luke goes back to Adam. Because Luke is showing him as man, therefore the genealogy goes back to the first man, Adam. Okay, now John. Look over in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Jesus in John is shown as God. So here's his genealogy, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now verse 14 tells you the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word there is a reference to Jesus Christ. But we don't call him Jesus because Jesus is his name as a man. This is Jesus as God. Now, I mean, he is referred to as Jesus in the book of John. But when we're looking at the genealogy of God, He's not referred to as Jesus, because that's his name as a man. You don't see the name Jesus given until the angel tells either Mary or Joseph, whoever got told first, that his name shall be called Jesus. Uh, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, so that's Jesus Christ, as God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. God has no beginning, he has no end, so it doesn't say... Um, like the Catholics say that Mary is the mother of God. Well, if that was true, then it would say, in the beginning was Mary, and Mary beget Jesus. Right? Mother of God. M Mary's not mentioned here. Yeah, Mary's mentioned in Matthew, mentioned in Mark, mentioned in Luke, because she was the virgin birth. But we're talking about the genealogy of God here. And Mary is not the mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus, the man, but not of Jesus as God. The genealogy of God is he has no beginning, he has no ending. So when God started the beginning of, you know, Genesis 1-1 created the heaven and the earth, when he started it, he was there. The Word, Jesus Christ, was there, you know, as God. 
Um, the Word was there, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, there you go. Um, John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, God, he, as God, He's always existed. So right away, when you look at the genealogy of the four different uh, Gospels, you can see the different emphasis. Yeah, a lot of the stories in there are going to be similar, but you're going to see some differences based upon the emphasis of the different writers. Okay, so now let's look at the what people will call the Great Commission. The, at the end of the... So that was the beginning. Now, let's look at the, uh, the end, the uh, commission. The commission that Jesus gives to his disciples. Matthew 28. Uh, Matthew 28, verses 19. Well, let's look in verse uh, 18. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus is there with his disciples. Eleven now, because Judas Iscariot betrays Jesus and hung himself. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You won't see that statement in Mark, Luke, or John. I mean, God, Jesus as God does have all power, but it's not given to him. He always had it. He's all-powerful in the beginning. He was all power. He'll be all-powerful in the end, and he's all-powerful everywhere in between. Uh, you can't give God power because he already had it. And who would give it to him anyway? Because he's God. Someone gave it to him, then he wouldn't be God anymore. But as king of Israel, son of David, son of Abraham, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's why he's called king of kings. Basically what he's saying is, I'm king of kings. I'm Israel's king, but now that I've died, buried, and rose from the dead, now I am king of kings. I've destroyed Satan. Well, not destroyed, but uh, bound the strong man, taken away his power, spoiled principalities and powers. Now he's far above all those positions. So now he is not just Israel's king, but as Israel's king, he is king of kings. He is over all. He's got all power. So then verse 19, go ye therefore, in other words, since I am Israel's king and I have all power in heaven and earth, I am now sending you to do something. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. All the way to the end of the world. So he is... Um, you notice verse 19 and 20 shows what that commission is. It's teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things. It's basically teach the Gentiles. The commission here is teach Gentiles the Mosaic law. Because that's what Jesus commanded them in Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3. In Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3, uh, Jesus says, The Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, therefore whatsoever they say, that you observe and do. So he taught, Jesus taught his disciples to obey the Mosaic law. And now, as king, Israel's king, but also king of kings, he is now telling uh, his disciples to teach all nations, teach the Gentiles the Mosaic law. Why? Well, Exodus 19, 5 and 6 says that they would be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles to reconcile the earth back to God. So, you know, one thing that tells you then is that when you're at the end of Matthew, God has not given up on Israel. Israel's program is still continuing. Churchianity out there tells you, well, yeah, Jesus came to Israel, but because they crucified him, now, God starts the church with, uh, with Acts chapter 2, and that's where we are. So they start the new dispensation in Acts 2. But you see what happens, in, and we won't get to Acts today, but in Acts 1, there's a commission over there. Jesus talks to his disciples right at the end, just like he does in Matthew 28. The statement in Matthew 28 is 
time-wise, very similar, probably just before the statement that he gives in Acts chapter 1. And you notice here, it doesn't say, well, um, you need to uh, understand that the Israel's program is they are no longer having favored status, favored nation status because they crucified me. So now that they've done that, now um, really you just go into uh, all the world with the, with the gospel of, of grace. You know. um, that's not what it says. It does say teach all nations, but what it does is this continuing in the program in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, it says that Israel is to be a kingdom of priests to me to reconcile the earth back to myself for all the earth is mine. So this isn't the new dispensation starting in Acts 2. It's not some new gospel. It's not some new program. It's continuing God promised in Exodus 19. And he doesn't say, go and give the gospel, because that's what a lot of churchianity does. See, they like to build up, they like to enforce missions because with missions, it takes a lot of money to go out to these other nations. So they substantiate it with this verse. This is of the four commissions. This is the one by far that is used most often. The Catholics use the one in John more, uh, but fundamental churchianity, they all go to Matthew. They're certainly not going to go to Mark. Pentecostals go to Mark, uh, but the churchian fundamental churchianity, they all run to Matthew because then they can say, well, you see here, we got to go teach the gospel to all the unreached nations. And you know that's going to cost money, so you know, bring in money and the offerings there to uh, help support the mission program. So you can build up a bigger church if you, if you promote missions because then you've, that costs more money. So then you can get more money from the people. That's what it's all about. It's, it's not about reaching the unreached nations with the gospel. It's about getting money. But you notice he didn't say preach the gospel to them. He says teach all nations. And verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's a continuation of what was said in Exodus 19. So it's not a new dispensation starting. It's just continuing. It says Israel is going to be saved first. Then there'll be a kingdom of priests to the nations. So they got to go out not to give the gospel, but to give the law out there. So um, the Mosaic law so that the Gentiles may be saved and be part of God's kingdom on earth. This is right in line with what prophecy is said in the Old Testament. Nothing has changed here. Okay, the commission in Mark, Mark 16. Now, people really don't like this one. In fact, uh, it's been a while since I've studied it, but I think there's something like 400 uh, New Testament manuscripts out there, and I believe all of them but one, if I'm not mistaken, all but one, maybe two, but I think it's just one, all but one of the 400 or so uh, manuscripts leave the last part of Mark in here, verses 12 through uh, 19. But, uh, or verses 12 through 20, the last nine verses. Only one manuscript takes it out, but yet in the modern versions, they all want to take it out, or at least footnote it and say, the most ancient and most reliable manuscripts don't contain these verses. Because it's hard to explain this if you don't understand right division, if you don't understand Israel's program uh, is continuing at this point, then this doesn't make a lick of sense. So since it doesn't agree with their philosophy, they just exit out, you know, tear the page, crumple it up and throw it in the trash. Because they've got one manuscript out of 400 that did that. So, oh yeah, that's the most reliable. Well, how do you know that's the one most reliable? Well, because it's uh, in line with what we believe. <laughs> I mean, that, they won't say that, but that's what it is. So here you've got the, uh, the commission here. You can start in verse uh, 15. Uh, verse 15, Mark 16, 15. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So there you see the gospel isn't Trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. The gospel is repent, recognize you're a sinner, stop trusting in your own righteousness, and then get water baptized to join yourself with the believing remnant. Now we know that gospel then, and we'll get to that when we get into the text of Matthew. So the gospel here is repent and be baptized. And so we know that, yes, they're preaching the gospel, 
But what they're doing is they're preaching it to Israel. Uh, that would be the every creature there. It would be all of Israel. Because they got to go and you say, well, but it says go into all the world. Well, under the Leviticus 26, under the five cycles of chastisement, Israel is scattered among the heathen. And so, in fact, if you go back, and so what ends up happening is, during that tribulation period, then uh, they're persecuted for not taking the mark, not worshiping the image of the beast, and they end up being delivered to um, councils. Mark 13 talks about that. And then the Holy Ghost speaks through them. And that's where this speaking in unknown tongues comes in. And that's how the gospel is preached to every creature. Because they're told... If you, in fact, hold your place there and go to Acts chapter 1. Because I know this may be confusing. Because number one, it flies in the face of what fundamental churchianity says. Uh, and so it's hard to see it from uh, what God is really saying here from the correct perspective of right division. Um, in Acts chapter 1, you can see they are told here, uh, they ask the question of Jesus in Acts 1 verse 6. In Acts 1 verse 6, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You've been talking about the kingdom. Is this the time where it's going to take place? They just crucified you. Is this the time where it's going to where the kingdom is going to be restored back to Israel. Uh, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the, this is the last thing that Jesus says to them before his ascension into heaven. But you notice here, he tells them this is what you're going to do. You're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you're going to be witnesses unto me. It says both. Okay, let's write that one up here. Um, Acts 1, 8 says both. Now, if you know English... Uh, what both means is there's two things, and both is true. If it's more than two things, then it's not both. It's several, you know, it's a few. Three would be few, probably four would be several, um, you know, and you go on from there. But uh, both is a reference to two. So there's two groups of people here. He says, you're going to be witnesses unto me in Judea, and all Judea, and Samaria. So both is... The first one is Israel. You're going to be witnesses unto me in Israel, which is Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. But you're in Jerusalem now, so you're going to start in Jerusalem, then you'll go to Judea, and then you'll go to Samaria, and you'll reach all of Israel that way. But you'll also be, secondly, unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the first part is Israel, the uttermost part of the earth then is to the Gentiles. So you got Israel and the Gentiles. And that's both. Both is two. And there's four things listed there. Now, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the most part of the earth. Four things listed. But that can't be both. Both is only two. So both is Israel and to Gentiles. Well, we shouldn't say Gentiles. We should say, uh, let's just say the nations. And I'll tell you why I changed that. Because here's the thing, is that all the lost sheep of the house of Israel due to the fifth cycle of chastisement are scattered among uh, the nations. They're all over the place. Okay, with that in mind, look in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. There's a lot of verses you got to piece together to figure all this stuff out. But when you do, it makes sense. Jesus is talking here in Matthew 24 about the, uh, the, uh, the end times. And he says, basically, the second coming is going to take place. He says in Matthew 24, 14, he says, This gospel of the kingdom, what's that? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Recognize you're a sinner and... Uh, Trust in God to save you and be water baptized to join the believing remnant. This gospel of the kingdom 
shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So this, hit, and this is where your churchianity will pull this verse out. Oh, you see, we got to reach the unreached nations. If, if there's a nation out there that hasn't heard the gospel yet, then Jesus can't come back yet. So let's get a whole bunch of money together and let's send a missionary out to that nation. And once they're all reached, then the rapture will take place. See, that's what they say. But that's the mystery. That hasn't even been revealed yet. We're not in that dispensation yet. We're talking about Israel's program. And it's not the gospel of the grace of God that Paul preached. It's the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So the gospel, it's a kingdom gospel, according to this verse. Kingdom gospel goes to all the world. Before... Jesus' second coming, before Jesus comes back, his second coming, goes to all the world. But now I'll go over to Matthew 10, look at Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, he says in verse 23, Matthew 10 23. Again, talking about them going to preach the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. It says in Matthew 10, 23, it basically says, go to this city and preach the gospel of the kingdom. But if they reject you, then don't dwell there. Go to the next city. Shake the dust off your feet. Go to the next city. If they reject you there, go to the next city. And you just keep going. He says in Matthew 10, 23, when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Okay, so Matthew 24, 14 says, the kingdom gospel has to go to all the world. Wait, didn't it say specifically nations there? Preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the kingdom gospel has to go to all the world, to all nations, before Jesus comes back. But yet Matthew 10, 23 says, the little flock won't get out of Israel. Won't get out of Israel before Jesus comes back. Seems like a contradiction, right? I mean, how... how, how so... <laughs> You know, what this does is, is this just shoots to pieces the missionary goal of most of churchianity. We've got to reach the unreached nations. Guess what? The, all the nations are going to be reached before they even get out of Israel. There's no missionary program here. They stay in Israel and all the nations are going to be reached. Well, how does that happen? Well, back then you probably couldn't explain it, but I can now. I mean, look at, look at what we've got going here. I mean, on Sunday, we had somebody from Croatia. We had people from England. Um, sometimes we have people from Australia. Uh, we have people from Germany. We have people from Canada, United States. We got people all over the world. Now, not every nation, but we got through modern technology. I can see be in my home in Alabama and preach sound doctrine, and the whole world can hear it. And if, you're, if you don't get it live, it can be on YouTube. I've got, there are people, they give me a list of all these, you know, you can get all the statistics of these different nations uh, where the, they're listening to YouTube videos. They're all over the place. They're all over the world. Um, so the sound doctrine and the gospel right now is being preached to all the world from my living room <laughs> because of technology. So what happens here is the little flock they get, remember, they get persecuted. So what happens when they get persecuted? They get arrested. Look over in Mark 13. Look at Mark 13. In Mark 13. Here, you get the same thing as we saw in Matthew 24. Uh, but also notice the wording of this. It, it didn't say, in Matthew 24, 14, it didn't say, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to 
all nations. It said, so Matthew 24, 14, here, uh, gospel, it says it is uh, preached in all the world for a witness. Gospel is a witness unto all nations. Now over in Mark 13, uh, parallel passage, Mark 13, 10. Mark 13, 10 says, Mark 13, 10 says, the gospel must first be published among all nations. Gospel published among all nations. It doesn't say they're going to all nations. It doesn't say the gospel is to, specifically to them. But the gospel is published among all nations. How? How is it published among all nations if they don't get out of Israel? Well, it tells you verse 9, Mark 13, 9, Take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. So this is where it's going to happen. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. So basically, they're going to be brought before these councils and synagogues. That shows you they're in Israel, they're under that Jewish religious system. Then they're brought before rulers and kings because they got to make sure you enforce it. Just like with Jesus. Jesus was brought before Caiaphas, the high priest. And once the high priest sentenced him, he was brought before Pilate, who was a governor uh, under the Romans. So they're going to be brought before these synagogues and these councils that the little flock is. They're going to be arrested. And then they're brought, taken to court, basically, to rulers and kings. And they stand before them and they have to give witness. And basically what Jesus says is, don't try to defend yourself, because that's what you would normally do. You'd say, well, I don't want them beheading me, so I'm going to try to talk my way out of it. He says, don't worry about that. He says, it's going to be given unto you in that hour what you speak, because it's not you that speaks, but the Holy Ghost. So how is the gospel published among all nations? The Holy Ghost is going to give them the words to speak, which will be the gospel. And just like this broadcast here today, you watching it live, you can watch it in different nations, you can watch it on YouTube, on all these different nations, when you've got the one world order with the Antichrist, and he's controlling all the technology, because Satan is the prince of the power of the air, then they're going to bring these people up before these councils, and the whole world can see it. In fact, it may be mandatory to watch this to show you you, you better not bow down to, you better bow down to the image and you better take the mark or this is what's going to happen to you. You ever see those uh, videos? I've heard of them. I wouldn't watch it because I don't want to see it, but I've heard the videos of these, um, these um, Arabs under the, the Islamic Arabs who will uh, get, say, take a U.S. guy captive and they consider us to be infidels. And so then they record video and they publish it all over the world of them cutting off the head of the person with the dull blade because we want to show that you're an infidel and you better not mess with us because we're coming after you, that type of thing. Well, that's what's going to happen under the Antichrist. They're brought before kings and rulers and they got to show to the Antichrist that they're punishing these people. And so then it's going to be broadcast all over the world with the modern technology. Everybody can see it. And um, the Holy Ghost is going to speak through them. Isaiah 28, with another tongue I will speak, speaking in unknown tongues. So they're going to be speaking the gospel of the kingdom, and that's going to be heard all over the world. So the lost sheep of the house of Israel may be saved. So, is, so the little flock goes from city to city in Israel. They don't finish doing that before Jesus comes back. But yet, the gospel, the kingdom gospel, goes to all the world. It's not preached to the nations, like churchianity tries to do with their mission program, but it is a witness unto all nations. 
the witness is the lost sheep of the house of Israel in those nations are going to believe the gospel and now they are going to be in that kingdom and so it will be a witness to those nations of this is the true gospel, this is a saving gospel, this is Jesus is the true Christ and not the Antichrist. Mark 13, 10, the gospel is published among all nations. All nations hear it due to modern technology through these councils and them speaking an unknown tongue. They don't know what they're speaking, but they're known, they're unknown to the speaker, but they're known languages to those who are hearing. But the ones who have an ear, Jesus says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Every single one of those seven churches, it says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The only ones who are going to hear the gospel of the kingdom are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because if the rulers and everybody could hear that gospel, they're going to silence them. You know, if I start going into, let's say if I went into Congress and I start, you know, I somehow I was able to get the floor and I was able to talk for, you know, public comments and I get three minutes. They say, okay, you got your three minutes, you sign up, you did all that stuff. And I start preaching Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. And I start preaching that. I guarantee you I wouldn't get my full three minutes. They'd shut me up real quick because they don't want that being taught. So that's the same thing here. But if it's spoken in unknown tongues and the Holy Ghost causes only the lost sheep of the house of Israel to hear that gospel, the other people, they hear whatever it is. They hear something different. They don't hear the gospel, so they get to keep speaking and then it's published in the whole world. So that's how it goes to the whole world. So forget the missionary program. God never had that. The, the, you know, the Antichrist and Satan, he's going to provide it for them. You know, look at Paul. God told Paul, Jesus told Paul to go to all the world and preach the gospel of grace. He didn't have to foot the bill. He was arrested. He appealed to Caesar. And he got a free trip to Rome as a prisoner. Uh, so it's as prisoners and courts of law and the modern technology that they preach the gospel of the kingdom in unknown tongues but known to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's how it's published. So now going back to Mark 16, maybe now we can understand this a little better when it says there in Mark 16, verse 15, he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, obviously, he's, this isn't a missionary program. He's not telling them to go to these nations because we already learned that he told them in Acts 1.8, you're going to go to Israel and then you're going to go to the nations, but they won't go to the nations until the millennial kingdom. How do we know? Well, because he said in Matthew 10, 23, you're going to go from city to city in Israel, and you won't finish going through Israel before Jesus comes back. Yet the gospel of the kingdom goes to all the world before Jesus comes back. So all this missionary program about, oh, we got to reach the unreached nations. God takes care. First off, that's not to us. But even for Israel, God takes care of it. They don't have to come up with some missionary fund. They just stay in Israel and they go from city to city. They, now, they need money to pay for their expenses to go from city to city, which is why Jesus told them to sell all that they have and lay it at the disciples' feet. So now we've got all the resources to go from city to city in Israel. But it's not like they need to hop on a plane and go to another nation. They just go from city to city and they'll persecute them. They'll brought before trials for councils and then they'll have free of charge broadcast their trials uh, uh, you know, in the court and they will speak, Holy Ghost will speak through them in unknown tongues and the lost sheep of the house of Israel will hear the gospel. So the kingdom gospel will go to all the world before Jesus comes back even though the little flock never gets out of Israel. Uh, so, but now going back here, so that explains the Mark 16, 15 and you notice verse 16, that's the believe and be baptized. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Believe and be baptized. And based on the timing, we probably won't get to it till uh, next week. And then it says, verse 17, and this is why they'll say they'll believe the one phony manuscript out of the 400 of the New Testament and say, oh, we got to cut out the last uh, what, nine verses, nine through 20 out of there. With the longer ending of Mark is not supported by the most ancient and reliable manuscripts. They don't bother to tell you that 400 supported and one doesn't um, because it doesn't fit their agenda. And so they just take it out or they at least footnote it and say, well, you can't rely upon this. Why? Well, because they have a problem with verse 17. 
these signs shall follow them that believe. Not those who have the faith of the grain of the mustard seed, or, you know, maybe it says, no, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, Pentecostals can fake some of this stuff, you know, the tongues casting out devils, but... Um, Taking up the serpents, yes, some of them do that, but uh, I haven't met one yet that brings out a bottle of, and it really is poison, and actually drinks poison in front of you, and you know that it's poison. They're not going to do that. Well, they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Benny Hinn would try to heal people to go on stage, but they would, they would weed them out. Somebody's in a wheelchair, couldn't walk, they don't get up there. Well, why not? God made the lame man to walk before. He can't do it under Benny Hinn. It's not that he can't do it. He's not doing it. He's not doing that today. So then they think that Mark 16, they believe that, you know, they, they think this is to us today. We're spiritual Israel. And so this doesn't fit their agenda. So they fake the ones that they, signs that they can't fake. And then the others they don't do. And then they'll say, well, you know, longer ending of Mark isn't in the most ancient and reliable manuscripts. Um, so then... Uh, verse 19, the Lord ascends to heaven. Verse 20, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So uh, look at going back to, I know we took a long tangent on there, but hopefully that helped explain, uh, give you a little idea of the, the Gospels here. Mark is showing them as a servant. So as king, the commission in Matthew was, Teach. I have all power, so go and teach the Gentiles the Mosaic Law in that millennial reign. But in Mark, it is, okay, now you're going to go and be that servant, and we got to get the lost sheep of the house of Israel saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So since they're trying to get the Jews saved by preaching the gospel, and we already went over how all that happens then there are going to be signs that follow them because the Jews will look for a sign. You look at Jesus many times. They said, show us a sign and we will believe, which they're lying. They didn't believe anyway, but they would ask for a sign. The Jews, that's just their mindset. They require a sign to believe. And since they're going to be the servant, remember the servant works. We read Mark 1, and Jesus did this, and he did that, and he did this, and he did that. So the commission for the disciples and Mark is one of working. You're going to cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink any deadly thing, heal the, uh, heal the sick. So you've got uh, working. So this is Mark 16, and we started in verse 15 down through verse 20. And this is uh, working by doing signs. So that's the commission and Mark, which goes along with the servant theme of Mark. Uh, Luke. So let's look at the Luke commission. I want to get through the Luke and the John before we uh, finish today. Uh, the Luke commission is at the very end, chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And this is the one that is probably neglected more than anything else because it's not really seen as a, a, a commission, so to speak. It's, uh, it's very brief. Um... So verse uh, Luke 24, 46 and 47. Luke 24, 46 and 47. Luke 24, 46 says that Jesus, this is you know, again just before his ascension, he said unto them, he said unto the disciples, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, among all nations, not to all nations, but among all nations, because the lost sheep of the house of Israel in the fifth cycle of chastisement are scattered among the nations, scattered among the heathen. So it's preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you see in Acts 8, um, by that time, they're still in Jerusalem. So they're in Jerusalem until the uh, Israel's program is put on hold. But you can see the emphasis here is the, it's about the Christ suffering, rising from the dead the third day. 
and then uh, preaching the uh, preaching repentance and remission in His name, in Christ's name. So the focus here is now it's not Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. It's still believe and be baptized for the remission of sins. But the focus here is on the perfect man, Christ. Christ suffered. Christ rose from the dead. And since he did that, now you can preach this gospel in his name and people will be saved. So the focus here is on Christ. In this commission. Which, of course, Luke is focused on the man, Christ. This is focused on the man, Christ, and what he did. He suffered. He rose from the dead the third day. And now he has all the power over in, in heaven and earth given to him. So now in his name you can preach this gospel and it will, uh, you know, it will save the people. Okay, and now John, John chapter 20, is uh, the, gospel, the Great Commission in John. And this is the one the Catholics like. John 20, verses 21 through 23. John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So this is the commission. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Remember when Jesus, when he was, he was just a normal boy. Well, I shouldn't say he was a normal boy growing up. He didn't have a sin nature. He didn't do all the bad things that boys do. But uh, in terms of, you know, he didn't do any miracles, in other words, when he was a boy. It wasn't until he was age 30 that he was baptized by John and then the Holy Ghost descended upon him like a dove. Then he goes 40 days in the wilderness and when he comes out of there, then he starts doing all these miracles and things. He had to receive the Holy Ghost first, and then he did the miracles. It's because it's the Holy Ghost doing it through him. And then it says, so that's what Jesus says to them. He says, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So when I got the Holy Ghost, Jesus is saying, basically, then I started doing these miracles, preached the gospel of the kingdom. So that's what you're going to do. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins he retain, they are retained. So this is where they like the Catholics like to throw this in there and say, well, you see, this is the commission from Jesus to, and Peter was the leader of the apostles, and Peter is the first pope. And so this is the authority given by Jesus to the Catholic Church via Peter as the first pope to have the ability to remit sins. But there's no Catholic Church here. There's no Pope. Peter wasn't the Pope of the Catholic Church. It was just the power that he had as man. He could do that too. And that's why, so filling this in here, uh, the commission is uh, forgiveness of sins. They could go and, you know, here they have the authority in Matthew to teach the Gentiles because... Jesus is king. And Mark, they do the signs to get the gospel, to show the gospel is true. And Luke, the focus is on what Christ did. And on John, the focus is on the forgiveness of sins. Because God is the one who forgives sins. But the power to forgive sins is given to them, just like it was to Jesus. And that's why I mentioned with Matthew, I mentioned how one of the problems with churchianity is they'll, they'll say Jesus is fully man and he was fully God, but in practice, they don't really see him as a man. I mean, maybe they see him as a man when he dies on the cross. But everything he does, the miracles, the forgiveness of sins and all this stuff, they automatically assume, well, that's, that's because he was God. Uh, but that's not how he did it. I mean, certainly Jesus is God, and I'm sure he did miracles in the book of John as God, but... Um, for the most part, it says, man, I mentioned in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, Jesus never refers to himself as God. And let's just look, to give you, show you, um, overcome a common misconception since we have a little bit of time before we end. Let's go over to Matthew, oh, I want to say chapter 8. Let's look at Matthew chapter 8. 
This is one of the first miracles at least mentioned specifically. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter uh, 9. No, uh, yes, Matthew 9. Matthew 9. The uh, one here, sick of the palsy. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2. And behold, they brought to him, brought to Jesus, a man sick of the palsy lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Okay, let's, uh, I'm just going to put it up here. Matthew 9.2, uh, Matthew 9.2, Jesus sees their faith and forgives their sin. So when we read that, people automatically assume, well, yeah, Jesus is God. So as God, he can see in their heart and sees their faith. And as God, he can forgive their sin. Forgives their sin. That might be a little more legible. <laughs> but if we keep reading, notice what he says here. Uh, so the scribes, verse 3, says, this man blasphemed because they're thinking just like we do. The only way he can forgive sins and see faith is if he's God. So if he's saying he forgives sins, well, he's blaspheming. He's claiming to be God. No, I mean, he is God, and he does claim that in John, but he doesn't claim that in Matthew. So he says, so they're accusing him of saying he's God by being able to forgive sins. Verse 4, Jesus knowing their thoughts. Jesus knew their thoughts. Again, these seem like things that only God can do, right? I mean, I don't know what you're thinking right now. You're probably thinking, I wish he had finished because it's almost it's time to get, you know, get ready for bed. Um, but I don't know if you're really thinking that or not. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know your thoughts. Jesus knew their thoughts. I also can't see your faith. I can be a fruit inspector. By your fruits, you shall know them but I can't really see if you're really saved or not. I don't know what you believe on the inside. So you think, well, this is God, right? Jesus says God. He sees their faith, he forgives their sins, and knew their thoughts. But look at what he says in verse 5. For whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk. Now notice verse 6. But that ye may know that the Son of Man, not Son of God, Son of Man, hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine own house. Son of man forgives sins. You say, well, how is that? As a man, I don't know if someone's got real faith or not, so I can't forgive somebody's sins, and I don't know somebody's thoughts, I don't know if they're just trying to agree to believe the gospel so I'll shut up and leave them alone. I don't know what they're thinking or if they truly believe it. I don't know. But he doesn't say it's a son of God to forgive sins. He says it's a son of man to forgive sins. The reason he could do it is because he was given the Holy Ghost. So Jesus as a man, is like Eric as a man, I don't know if someone has faith. I don't know their thoughts. I, I don't ask me to forgive you of your sins. I don't have that authority. But Jesus had the Holy Ghost given to him, and the, because the Holy Ghost is God, the Holy Ghost allows him to see their faith, and to forgive their sins, and to know their thoughts. It says the Son of Man, he does that. So in John 20, that's why he gives them that commission. He says, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Why? Because he said in the verse before, he blew on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. You've got the Holy Ghost who will tell you if what's going on there. Look over in Acts 5 and you can see that. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, they're supposed to, the little flock is supposed to sell all they have and lay it at the disciples' feet, and then that money can be used so they can go to all the cities of Israel. Right? So here's Ananias and Sapphira, and they sell their possession, and they think, well, you know, 
Peter's not going to know if we just keep a little back back for ourselves. You know, we'd like to, before we have to go and suffer in all these cities of Israel, maybe we'll go on a little vacation. You know, or I don't know what they're thinking. But anyway, they don't give all the money. So Acts 5 verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to who? Not to me, to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land. Verse 4, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Now, a little bit later, Sapphira's wife comes along. She didn't know what happened. And the same thing happens with her. She lies about it. And then uh, in verse 10, she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. Now, how did Peter know that? Peter isn't, you know, Jesus, you could say, well, he's God, right? Peter is not God. He's just an ordinary man. But the difference is, he received the Holy Ghost, John 20, 21 through 23, and the Holy Ghost told Peter, they've kept back a part of that. And so when they said that, and that's why Peter says, you didn't lie unto me, you lied unto the Holy Ghost. Because Peter, as a man, he doesn't know if they kept back a part of it. You know, just like, I don't know your thoughts. I don't know if you got faith or not. I can be a fruit inspector, but that's all I can do. You know, if Ananias brought a reasonable amount to Peter, he would have no reason to believe it wasn't the whole thing. But yet he's so confident in it, he says, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. You've kept back part of it. And you can see that the Holy Ghost is speaking those words through Peter because he falls down and dies. And then Sapphira's wife, the same thing happens, and she dies. So that's why the Jesus as the Son of Man forgives sins. Jesus as the Son of Man does miracles, casting out devils, healing the sick. The disciples, as regular ordinary men, they do miracles as well. And they have the power to forgive sins or to retain sins. In this case, Peter retained it. Why? Well, Peter knew that they did not have faith. He knew their thoughts, that they were lying, and so he retained their sin. How does he know that? The Holy Ghost told him. Just like the Holy Ghost told Jesus in Matthew 9 that the people who brought the sick of the palsy had faith, and so he forgave their sins, and he knew the thoughts of the Pharisees there who says he's blaspheming. Um, so it's as the Son of Man he does that. And when you see that, then that helps you understand Peter's not the first pope, and this isn't some authority that the Catholic Church uh, can claim because I can tell you the pope himself, no matter who, what pope it is, no matter what time period it is, the pope could not utter the words um, in verse Acts 5.9, the Pope could never stand before anybody and say, Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. No matter, they say the Pope is the vicar of God. He does not have the power to just speak a death sentence and boom, the person falls down. So that's never happened with any Pope ever. So you know the Pope and the Catholic Church does not have the same power as Peter did and the same power as Jesus did because the Holy Ghost was in Jesus and was in Peter and it was for the at-hand phase of the kingdom. I don't know if I wrote that down there. But this is the at-hand phase of the kingdom and it's for to get all the lost sheep of the house of Israel saved. And so the Holy Ghost, they need signs. Remember the Jews require a sign. So part of the signs is casting out devils, healing the sick, and doing those things in Mark 16. But there's also the signs of the Holy Ghost knows your thoughts and knows your faith. There aren't going to be any fakers here. There are a whole bunch of fakers out there in churchianity who claim to be representing God so they can get your money. And there are a whole bunch of fakers out in the pews to claim to be, oh, I haven't sinned all week when you know they've sinned every day. Um, but there, that, you don't get away with that stuff here. You're giving the money, but you didn't give all of it. Boom, you're dead. 
you fall down dead right now. I know you didn't give it because the Holy Ghost is in charge here. So this idea that they can forgive sins, the Pope, Catholic priests can forgive sins, not a single Pope or Cardinal or priest or any of them have ever spoken a death sentence and the person just fell down dead. Now, maybe they could, you know, kill them with a sword or shoot them or something, but as far as just speaking words and the person falls down dead, that's never happened and it never will happen in the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church has no business claiming John 20, verses 21 through 23 for themselves. Peter, given to Peter, because it was the at-hand phase of the kingdom, and you see it working here. Uh, and, of course, the reverse can be true, too. They would, um, people would be saved in Acts chapter 2 uh, when he preached the, there in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says about 3,000 souls were saved. Um, you know, there may have been more than that there, but the apostles were told by the Holy Ghost when they, when they would go to baptize somebody, the Holy Ghost would say, that person has truly repented and, um, and is trusting God to save them. They've abandoned their religion. And so they say, okay, their sins are forgiven, water baptize them. There are probably others who came, and the Holy Ghost revealed to the apostles, nope, they're faking it, they didn't really believe, so they didn't get water baptized. I mean, it doesn't say that, but based on Acts 5, and you can, and the commission of John 20, you can tell that. So, um, anyway, there's your four different Gospels, the different emphasis, and the different genealogies and commissions. And there's a whole lot more we could say about that, but hopefully that's a good start to hopefully overcome a lot of misconceptions of churchianity about what's going on in these, uh, in these Gospels. So next time, we'll start in Matthew and we'll go over just basic, we're not going to go over the whole thing, but main key events that happen through the Gospels. Uh, we'll start that next time. So let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for saving our souls by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will help us believe your word using the mind of Christ and applying sound doctrine so that others may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, bringing you great glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.